next week. Next week, call upon uh, Dr. Krishna Ratnam for his talk on chronic idiopathic thrombocytopenia. Next week, call upon Dr. Krishna Ratnam completed his uh, MBBS in uh, 1980 University of Madras. MD Internal Medicine in 1984, Madurai, DM Medical Oncology in uh, 1987, University of Madras, FRCBA in 1999, uh, MRCB in 2003. He is presently working as a visiting consultant hematologist in Sri Ramchandra Medical Center, consultant in hemato oncology and bone marrow transplantation in Cancer Institute area, and consultant hematologist in the Sundara Medical Foundation. He has worked for between 2000 and 2006 as a consultant hematology and bone marrow transplantation, uh, Sultan Kabus in University Hospital, Muscat. I request you to please take Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So this is actually a very common uh, topic for day-to-day uh, -day practice. In fact, uh, my talk will not have any attractive pictures like the previous speaker. Unless you have a normal patient count, none of the previous surgeries might be possible. So you need a normal relation count for everything. So what I thought was I slightly tweak the topic. I mean, uh, initially it was supposed to be chronic ITP, but I wanted to make it as an approach to low patient count and then a uh, few words about chronic ITP because you see it uh, very often in practice and uh, sometimes it's extremely useful for the general practitioners uh, for how to manage a platelet and when to give transfusion, when not to give transfusion. So, as you all know that the platelets uh, are produced by the megakaryocytes in the bone marrow and uh, they are actually the mother of the platelets and uh, this is how the megakaryocytes looks like. In fact, it is one of the largest cells when you see the bone marrow which I'll be showing you shortly. And so the megakaryocytes are, are the ones which are responsible for the production of platelets and each megakaryocyte produces approximately 1000 to 5000 platelets. So whenever you approach a, play, a patient with a low platelet count, it is less than 150,000. I mean, normal platelet count is 1.5 to 4 times per cubic millimeter. So the first thing you have to see what is the clinical context. Then, you know, many times it is routinely picked up when you do a master checkup. You know, what I see, the master checkup is so common and you get some mild thrombocytopenia. So it can be picked up in the routine clinical, I mean, when the patient is quite well and uh, is not sick at all. Or if your patient is bleeding or is quite sick. So these are the clinical scenarios that is possible. <coughs> so one of the questions I ask whenever I have a, when I am confronted with a patient who has a low patient count. The first thing is whether the patient is well or unwell and he has got any other systemic disease like arthritis or renal failure or liver problem, etc. And if the patient is in ICU, because one of the common concerns you get in ICU is low patient count. Because uh, one in at least four or five in the ICU has got a low platelet count with a multifactorial problem. And it's a patient febrile, especially acute febrile illness, because ITP is seldom patient has a fever. So if you have a patient who's got a fever and a low platelet count, you can be very sure that it is not ITP. <coughs> and if this patient is symptomatic or asymptomatic, and it's picked up in protein blood counts or he has sought medical attention for BD. And you see the problem of production or destruction. I mean, it could be produced normally and is destroyed in the periphery, the classical example of immune thrombocytopenia. Or there could be a marrow suppressive effect where it is not produced. So these are the questions running through your mind whenever you see a patient with a low platelet count. So the definition of platelet count is less than 150,000. And there are different uh, ranges of low platelet count from mild, moderate, and severe. So if, the one thing is, you should always repeat the patient count if you are in doubt. The patient is very well and it is picked up uh, in a routine uh, clinic, I mean routine uh, a master checkup or a routine screening. If, if the history and examination are incompatible with the laboratory abnormality, you have to repeat the patient count and cross check with the yeah, That's very important, I tell you why. Because you can have artifactual causes of low patient count. Many times it happens. The patient will be clumped. You know, nowadays, you know, all the platelet counts are done by the automated machine. Not like our good old student days where it's manually counted. So nobody, I don't think to my knowledge now, uses a manual platelet counting in the 
newborn chamber which we used to do in the physiology lab those days. It's all notes are relegated to the museum. So we can have platelet clumping and clumps of platelets can be counted as a single platelet by the machine. So the machine will give you very uh, er erroneous reports. And the, the platelet, if the, the blood is not collected properly, if it is clotted, then most of the platelets are consumed. Then you will not have a normal platelet count. And sometimes big platelets. See, after all, the machine, it doesn't know which is platelet, which is red cell, which is white cell. It's programmed to count because of its size. If the platelets are big, then it won't, it will miss out on the platelet. It will, it will count as something else. So, giant platelets, and of course, faulty collection. So, these are all the artifactual or spurious causes of thrombocytopenia. So, as I told you, you can have platelet clumps. So, this will definitely affect your uh, platelet uh, count in the machine. So, you always check the, uh, cross check the platelet count by peripheral smear because peripheral smear is a very, very invaluable tool even today. <coughs> these are all the clumps. Or you can have giant platelets, but platelets are very big in size. So, this will definitely give you a very low patient count. So this is very, very important and very cautious. So when a patient is well and he's just picked up routinely and you get a sort of a you know, panicky call, always please repeat the patient count. And the EDTA induced clumping. Most of the time it is because it's, it's an X vivo, it's a, it's a, a X vivo phenomenon or an in vitro phenomenon. Because of the EDTA, it causes clumping. So because of some of the antibodies to the EDTA are coated in the patient and it causes clumping. So you may have to repeat the platelet count using acetrated blood. And this is a very, not, a, not at all an uncommon scenario to see a lot of uh, clumping because of the EDTA. So you may have to repeat it in the, by the acetrated blood. So another cause is, as I told you, is a giant platelet. Big size platelets will uh, bring down the platelet count. So you have to be, these are all some of the caveats whenever you interpret the uh, <coughs> platelet count. So now you need to know, let us say it is a genuine low platelet count, you need to know whether it is related to production or destruction. So you have some clues, how do you know it is a problem of production or it is produced normally but destroyed in the periphery. So is it an isolated thrombocytopenia or a pancytopenia? If you have a patient with a pancytopenia, definitely it is a production problem because all the lines are affected. So it is a very, very simple clue. Of course, systemic symptoms and signs. If you have a patient with a liver disease, then you know it is a problem of patient count this with sequestration by the splenomegaly or any chronic disease where there is a narrow suppression. Uh, so these are so patient has got a cancer and got a narrow infiltration. Definitely patient will be looking sick. He won't be looking healthy at all. As opposed to a patient with ITP who will be looking very much normal when he comes to the clinic. And the important biochemical clues, of course, like liver function, renal function. And LDH is an important marker which we use because if the patient has got a high LDH and a low platelet count, it means definitely there is a narrow infiltration or there is an associated red cell destruction like Ivan syndrome or there could be hemolytic uremic syndrome or TTP. So this is a normal bone marrow uh, biopsy uh, where you see the megakinesite. These are the megakinesite which are looking very big in the usual HND section. This is the megakinesite. Whereas this is a patient who is completely marrow is wiped out. So you have a pancytopenia and hypocellular or aplastic bone marrow. This is a the classical production problem. Just to give an example. So what are the production problems when you get a low platelet count? As I said, you know the clue will be high LDH, abnormal LFT, abnormal RFT and pancytopenia. You have to think of infiltrated disorders like leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma. Sometimes you get a this present with thrombocytopenia. Of course, marrow failure conditions like aplastic anemia and viral infection like HIV. That's very important because any low platelet count, it is mandatory to do a viral marker, screening for HIV, hepatitis B, and HCV. That's very important. And the other important thing is very um, common practice, B12 deficiency. They also present with the pancytopenia and high LDH, that's a very typical clue. If a patient has got a high MCV, high LDH, and a pancytopenia, definitely you should think of B12 deficiency. Of course, B12 level is easily available today in most of the labs. And uh, the other problem is a destruction problem. That is, it is produced normally, 
were destroyed in the peripherals uh, in the stream. So it means platelets are produced adequately but destroyed peripherally in the reticular endothelial system. So this is the con uh, once you know whether it is a destruction problem, then you have to classify whether it is immune or a non-immune. Because you can have a destruction in immune like ITP or you can have non-immune cause of destruction also, which I will be alluding to shortly. So, in a destruction problem, what happens, you see a lot of megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. Number of megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. That is, they are produced effectively, but they don't, when they come out, they get destroyed. So, this is another example, where in the peripheral smear, you don't see any platelets. One giant platelet, you see a big platelet. The bone marrow shows a lot of megakaryocytes. So, this is typical immune thrombocytopenia. Marrow is trying to produce churn out both a megakaryocyte a platelets and the end platelet is very big, just like the end red cell which is a reticulocyte which is quite big and you see number of uh, uh, megakaryocytes in the bone marrow. This is a typical immune thrombocytopenia. So if you have an immune thrombocytopenia then again you subclassify whether it's idiopathic thrombocytopenia which today is called an immune thrombocytopenia or it could be secondary to drugs, autoimmune condition or a viral infection. These are not secondary causes. And the non-immunes will be hypersplenism. Anybody with the spleno megali, they will sequester the platelets. And consumption, like a disseminated intravascular coagulation, heparin induced thrombocytopenia, and a TGP, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. These are all non-immune causes of peripheral destruction, where the platelets are produced normally, so get destroyed. So basically, you have a production problem, a destruction problem. Destruction, immune, and non-immune. So this is the algorithm we follow. So then they have thrombocytopenia in ICU setting. Because very commonly you get a you know, call from ICU where there is a low platelet count. And these are all the uh, hemodilution is one of the important causes for a low platelet count in an ICU setting. And you have increased platelet consumption, sepsis, DIC, um, and diffuse platelet production due to various drugs, and increased sequestration due to hyperspinism. Uh, these are all some of the causes of ICU induced, uh, ICU related thrombocytopenia. Most of the time it will not be ITP, it will be something else. Patient will be sick on multiple drugs, sepsis, DIC or getting heparin for a long time. So these are all the causes of thrombocytopenia in an ICU setting. Just I want to highlight this because this is one of the common concerns you see in ICU. So what are the approach when you see a low plate head count? As you know, the time honored is a thorough clinical examination and history. Examination of the hemogram and biochemistry is very important. You always ask for a full hemogram, peripheral smear, LFT, RFT, LDH. And peripheral, exam, peripheral smear examination in detail. That's one of the fundamental things you have to do, even in today's era of all sophisticated investigations. So what is the value of a peripheral smear? I think it's automatically your changing. So what is the value of a peripheral smear in a low patient call? See, you see a high uh, MCV, a big red cell, and you see hypersegmented neutrophil. This is typical B12 deficiency. This is the oval oocyte. Oval red cell and a high uh, number of segments in the neutrophil. If you see this, it is classical megaloblastic anemia or a B12 deficiency. Next. Uh, so this is an abnormal Sometimes you see hypersegmented neutrophil, as I told you, in megaloblastic anemia, or you see bilobed neutrophil. This usually costs you, you get it in myelodysplastic syndromes. So this is definitely not an ITP. This is a bilobed or called a pelgar anomaly. So just a classical example of abnormal neutrophil. So you have to look at all the series in a peripheral smear. And the other cause um, of a low platelet count with a high LDH and a peripheral destruction would be Fragmented red cells. These are all fragmentation. You see, this is a fragmentary hemolysis, the low platelet count. The commonest cause is TTP or thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. And if there is a renal failure associated, it becomes HUS. So, just to highlight why you need to see, uh, have a good peripheral smear evaluation. But I can tell you today, even that sometimes it will be difficult, it's a majority of the hospitals, you don't get a good quality smear, smear will be thick. And uh, you know you may not have a qualified pathologist, so that's going to be a problem even today.
you can get easily MRI, CT, CT, angio, but peripheral smear, reticulocyte count today, ESR, I find it difficult. So that's, that's the sad truth. So another classical example of fragmented red cells. So you should never miss examining a peripheral smear in a case of a low platelet count. Otherwise, you will miss the diagnosis. So important cause of fragmented tumors, as I have told you, TTP, HUS, DIC, and heart valve. The patient has got an artificial valve that can cause fragmentary hemolysis and a low platelet count sometimes due to consumption. So management of TTP is different. You don't use steroids. You have to transfer exchange. And if the patient has got a shigala associated TTP, just do hemodialysis, hemodialysis in HUS, they recover very well. Then, of course, heparin induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis. Uh, if you know it happens only after 5 to day, 10 days of heparin exposure. It can happen sometimes acutely if the patient is previously uh, exposed to heparin and is associated with thrombosis and is mediated by antibody to uh, heparin and platelet 4 receptor complex. And they bind together and it causes clumping of the uh, destruction of the platelets. They just come, the platelets all aggregate together and then they get destroyed. So it's not very common, but you have to keep it in your background. Especially the patient is uh, on heparin for quite some time or a cardiopulmonary bypass surgery. That's why I said in the first slide, the clinical context is very, very important. What is the clinical context where the patient has developed a thrombocytopenia? Then you have to st simply stop the heparin and put them on heparinoids or anti fat and like pontoparinoids. So suspicion is the key for a heat diagnosis because confirmatory lab tests are very, very uh, difficult. It is not done frequently in many labs and it's a very fiddly test, very finicky test. So it may not be possible to get a correct diagnosis. You have to go by clinical suspicion. Uh, so management of heat will be to stop the heparin. Do not transfer platelets because you'll be adding fuel to the fire and you can give factor 10 inhibitor like fond of And the viral associated thrombocytopenia are very common in practice. Any acute infection can cause thrombocytopenia, which is getting more and more detected now because of the RH CBC and uh, dengue is one of the common cause. Hepatitis B, HCV, HIV, these are all some of the important factors. Malaria is, uh, you should not miss malaria and thrombocytopenia, otherwise you look very foolish if you lose, lose mal miss malaria and thrombocytopenia. So peripheral smear again is very, very important. Uh, DIC, of course, happens in ICU setting and uh, where you get uh, abnormal PT, PTT and the management of the DIC is just management of the cause and give FFP and platelets. And uh, thrombocytopenia is important prognostic marker in an ICU setting. So now we come to the treatment. Our topic proper which is ITP. It will be finished in a few more slides. It's called immune thrombocytopenia. It's an autoimmune disorder characterized by immunological destruction. So platelets are coated by the antibody to develop an organ specific antibody, just like rheumatoid arthritis, which is directed against the joints. Here, the, the antibody is directed against the platelet protein. They get coated, and the reticular endothelial system recognizes it and it just delivers it. So, that is ITP. So, it is a normal production. And this is what I just told you. So, the platelet antigens uh, are the GP2B and 3A. For some reason, they just they have antibody against them, get coated, just get chewed up by the reticular endothelial system. And uh, so in an ITP, there is also an element of decreased production and increased platelet destruction and which leads to a thrombocytopenia. So there is some element of uh, production problem because of the antibody directed against the mechanicide plus against the platelet. So that result is a platelet, low platelet count. So initial what testing is required? It's a disease of exclusion. There is no confirmatory test. We don't do routinely antibodies. Of course, testing for HIV and CV are mandatory, and there is an association with H. pylori. So the criteria of ITP is very important. Isolated thrombocytopenia, absolutely no other symptoms. Patient will be well. Platelet count will be 3,000 or 4,000. Other counts should be normal. No constitutional symptoms, no lymphadenopathy, no splenomegaly, nothing. Except isolated thrombocytopenia otherwise well patient. So that's the most important thing. We always do a viral um, screening. When to do your bone marrow? There's always a, you know, a confusion going on because of the fear we all do bone marrow. Because somebody else will do bone marrow, so you might as well do the bone marrow. 
So that's the sort of a thing we, it happens. But actually, as per the guidelines, which the previous speaker was alluding to, there is no, actually no need to do a board, especially children, adult, if you are convinced with your clinical, peripheral smear examination, biochemistry, you don't need to do a bone marrow, except in elderly patient, or if the thrombocytopenia is not isolated, or there is a leukoerythroblastic blood picture, or there is increased LDH, then you do a bone marrow. Otherwise, it is not mandatory. Management is depends on clinic presentation. Above 30,000, you don't need to treat. So please keep it in mind, you don't need to do anything above 30,000. In fact, uh, for pediatric guidelines, they say, you don't need to treat unless the child is symptomatic. And um, this is all the various presentations and uh, many of you will be familiar, they come with bleeding everywhere. And acute emergency, we use uh, IV IgG or anti-D immunoglobulin if the patient are RH positive, steroids and iodose dexamethasone. These are the acute uh, choices in acute emergency, but IV IgG is quite expensive, uh, anti-D is moderate and steroids are quite economical. And iodose dexamethasone is another option. That what is the factor that determines the choice of initial therapy, severity of bleeding, how rapid you want, side effects, and cost. And the longer courses of steroids are preferred for over oh, short course. IVIG can be combined with steroids, and usually the dose is a mega dose. We give one gram per kg for two days. That's it, two gram per kg totally. And what is the role of platelet transfusion? Generally, it's not indicated because whatever you give will get destroyed. But unless it's a life-threatening emergency like an intracranial bleed, then you give it uh, along with, you can give recombinant factor 7A under platelet transfusion. Otherwise, you don't need to give platelets. Generally, I just want to highlight, you don't need to give platelet unless the patient is bleeding or less than 10,000. Because many times they go for consult in ICU or hospital, it's a bit indiscriminately used. It's not at all required. And many times you see, you know, the patients are in ICU. It is absolutely not required. So you just need to have a careful monitoring and the platelet transfusion has got clear recommendation. Unless the patient is bleeding or you're going to do a procedure or less than 10,000, you don't need to give prophylactic. Even for a dengue, the recommendation is less than 10,000. So what is the second line treatment? Whether it's splenectomy or we give what is called rituximab. The second line classical is splenectomy. Splenectomy, rituximab, and now today we have a current drug which is the platelet receptor agonist. So splenectomy, you have pros and cons, it's curative. When the patient is steroid dependent, persistent, refractory, you offer them splenectomy, you immunize them with all the vaccines, and then you can get expect a remission in 85%. It can be done by the aproscopy, it's quite economical. And of course, um, the, the cons are its unpredictability of response. You can get vascular complication like portal hypertension or pulmonary hypertension, sepsis, and very, very negligible uh, mortality. So some of the precautions, you have to vaccinate the child or a patient, and after the spirit, we need antibiotic prophylaxis. The other drug which we use is the rituximab or the anti b cell antibody to wipe out the immune system so that there is no antibody formation. And uh, we use this as a second line if the patient is not willing for a splenectomy. And the other one which is the latest in the armamentorium is that thrombopoietin receptor agonist. Just like you have erythropoietin, you have a thrombopoietin agonist, which is called uh, l thrombopag, uh, which is now available in the market, but it's quite expensive. But again, you have to use it for a long term. It is not like, you know, you can stop it after some time. So, so patients who are really are unwilling for splenectomy, and if they are refractory to many agents, then you might be, I mean, you have a reason to use this drug. If you are the patient, see, most of the patients are diabetic, so you can't use steroids for a long time. So then you may have to resort to that uh, if they are not willing for a, a spirectomy. And you have two uh, agents uh, internationally available. Romeoplastin is not available still in the country, but to be marketed. And of course, you have the trauma pack, which is available, but each tablet costs about 900 rupees of 25 mg, uh, 50 mg is a bit more expensive. We have to take it every day in the empty stomach. So that's uh, uh, one option is available. And what is the rationale for platelet stimulating agent? If it is a peripheral destruction, why do you want to use it? Because there is also an element of a production problem. So that's why just they use erythropoietin and a colony stimulating factor for white cell.
can use this uh, in ITP, it is recommended as a second line agent, not as a first line agent. So this is how the, uh, the, uh, the L trauma pack act. It just acts on the platelet signal transduction pathway. And so it's a receptor is there and it just gives a, a signal to the recurrent side to produce more platelets. So increased platelet production will be a trauma pack. So when to transfuse platelets, only when the patient is actively bleeding for neurosurgery, patient going to be above 100,000. For above other surgery, 50,000. Minor surgery, 20,000. For a prophylaxis, only 10,000. So these are the recommendations for a platelet transfusion. In ITP, generally, we don't transfuse platelet unless the patient is in dire straits, like intracranial hemorrhage. So we depend more on steroids, immunoglobulin, uh, those type of agents. Other second line agents are Dapsone, Danazol, Azathioprine, Cyclosporin. These are all immunosuppressive. Actually, they are third line, we can call it. Second line is rituximab and spinectomy. And these are the third line agents. So take home message is, every thrombocytopenia is not ITP. That is have to be very, very clear. Examination of the hemogram and blood smear is very critical. And bone marrow examination, uh, mandatory only associated with abnormalities of other cell lines. And of course, platelet transfusion, you have to be very judicious in using it. Thank you for your patience. The other disease that comes with this ITP is SLD. Correct. Lupus. It's the second day, second day. When I was in GH, we had a group of patients who had a splenectomy for thrombocytopenia, branded as ITP. So, five, six years down the line, they came to the product. Sure. Maybe they were having serologically positive SLD, then they ran away. They just came home. Exactly. It's a secondary cause. Not a primary, but a secondary cause. Thank you, sir. Now I request uh, Pagarvin to present him a certificate of appreciation.